Hey guys, I'm Jay Beershank. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me here. Today I'm going to try to do a video. I'm going to take it real slow so I don't, you know, rush myself or any of the information which I tend to do on my YouTube channel. I'll get better at that. Also, I wanted to say uh, recently I've been doing videos on my iPhone. I have uh, left my camera back home and I'm on a trip right now seeing some family. So my videos will be back up to par with the recent quality. But anyways, today we're going to do a video about Jordan Peterson. You may have heard about Jordan Peterson, you may not have. Um, I actually heard about him through a contro controversy that he appeared in in the news about a year ago um, with some pronoun stuff, but we'll talk about that later. Either way, whether you've heard of him or not, I would highly recommend uh, checking him out. He has two books, and uh, I haven't read either of the books, but I've watched his lectures on his YouTube channel. So he is a Canadian psychology teacher. He's a psychologist. Uh, I think he's a, a neurophysiologist as well. Um, he's very, very educated on what he speaks on. He definitely knows what he's talking about. And he's definitely put the mental work in. He's thought about these things, and I think he probably thinks about them more than he'd like to. He seems like he is consumed with answering the questions that he's came up with, which you know I can relate to, and I think that adds a lot of value to us because you know he's thought about this stuff for 30 years. 30 years is, you know, that's a third more than I've even lived. So you know he's <laughs> he's put the time in. So there's a lot of stuff to be gained there. Um, I've consumed about 25 hours of his lectures. Uh, the way that he does his YouTube channel is really cool. He uh, literally puts a camera inside of his classroom and he just records the whole lecture. So when you watch his YouTube channel, you're literally just sitting in the classroom listening. And I would take notes, um, I would pause the video. Each video, each lecture was about two hours, 15 minutes to like 2.45. Um, they usually took me four hours and a couple of days to get through because I'd usually stop, um, you know, and take notes and look up words and look up people who he's referencing and stuff because there was so much new stuff to me, so much to be learned. Um, it was impossible for me to, you know, be able to hold on to everything and to retain everything if I never paused and I never went and cross-referenced and read my notes and took extensive notes. Um, I filled up about two, th two and a half journals with notes of just the lectures and then I uh, filled the third journal or the, you know, the second half of the third journal uh, with basically a compilation of, there's 12 lectures and what I did is I compiled each lecture into like a couple pages because each lecture was like maybe like 10, 20 pages. So I tried to get it down to two or three. So I've put my time in. Um, I'm talking about a particular lecture series called Maps of Meaning. Maps of Meaning um, is a book that he wrote, I think, in 99. And uh, he spent, you know, I think 20 or 30 years before he did that book, kind of re researching the ideas that he talks about in the book. And um, I watched the lecture series from 2017. So he's been thinking about the Maps of Meaning ideas for maybe... <laughs> 50 years, so you know it, you, you could tell that he had formulated his ideas and he had talked about them many times and he was able to articulate them in a wonderfully eloquent manner. So basically I'll just kind of go over st starting with um, what is Maps of Meaning and what is the underlying idea and how did it help me. So. I took tons of notes like I told you and I was going to do this video with all of my notes but I kind of want to just source it and just kind of speak from my heart. So what Maps of Meaning meant to me was he was trying to figure out and understand and articulate what gives humans meaning to their life. What is the driving force that can keep us going, keep us sane, keep us driven and happy. And he basically talked in the first couple lectures about um, things called value structures and value structures are nested ideas that are mostly in our subconscious and we have a couple pieces of the value structure in our conscience. So let's say that the value structure is a tree and like up here you have at the top of the tree you have being a good person and then nested underneath that you have um, you know uh, being a good father and then you have 
taking care of your kids over here and then you have providing for your wife over here and then you have all these things that are nested underneath being a good person on the surface level in your conscience you're just concerned about being a good person and then nested underneath that there are layers upon layers upon layers of things in your subconscious of what being a good person constitutes and what's it mean and what it means but for your for simplicity's sake and for applicability sake to be able to function and not have to think about what being a good person means too much, just basically um, being able to program your subconscious to be able to progress you in the direction you wish to go, you simplify it by just saying good person. So that's an interesting idea of the value structure. Um, and another idea that gets brought up a lot in the maps of meaning is dominance hierarchies. So dominance hierarchies, I, I like this idea a lot. It um, it helped me synthesize a lot of things. That's the biggest thing that I would advocate for about Jordan Peterson is I'm not saying he's the Messiah or you know anything like that, but I had a lot of abstracted ideas that I was not able to synthesize into a clear vision and be able to articulate to myself and to others. But after watching him, he, um, he formulates ideas in constructive manner, you know, so if he's going to say something, he's going to say it in a way that is applicable, in a way that you can use, you know, there's utility in the statements and utility in the ideas, instead of them being kind of more lofty and ethereal, which is how a lot of my ideas were before watching it. Anyway, the dominance hierarchy idea is like, so humans have evolved um, for basically for okay like the most primal level to be able to reproduce right so we've evolved our tendencies to be more attractive to a mate and within that there is this idea of dominance hierarchies and humans are competing on dominance hierarchies and most humans uh, are competing on a couple like let's break some down we have like a physical health dominance hierarchy so like humans are competing in that way, then there's like the aesthetic one where it's like muscles and that kind of thing. That that's its own dominance hierarchy. There are people who are really aesthetically, you know, um, they're striving towards aestheticism, and they're at the top of that dominance um, dominance hierarchy. And there are people who are working up that one. And the point of being at the top is um, basically attractiveness to a mate, because um, well, I think you can I think that's self explanatory. So there's like the aesthetic one and then there's health, like how long you're gonna live, your diet, how well you take care of yourself. There's like financial, there's emotional, how well you can regulate your own emotions and stay calm. There's like, you know, there's it's just so many different hierarchies. Um you know, you could look at that as um, you know, the corporate ladder too, and there's uh so many the art artistic so basically each hierarchy i think can be broken down into millions of sub hierarchies like the physical hierarchy like whatever being physically fit and physically strong and healthy and good looking that can be broken down into a million sub categories you know like um diet mental uh health and how that constitutes to your body um you know yogic uh strength flexibility, um, you know. So that's a re really interesting idea. And then, um, so people are playing individual hierarchies. And then he kind of talks about the idea of the, as he, he um, correlates a lot of his ideas with mythology. He says that mythologies, you know, are, there's a reason that they've stuck around and there's a reason why we resonate with them. And it's because they're stories that have lasted, you know, throughout human history and they've lasted because they have something to tell us. And anyway, so the idea of mythology and the hero's journey and uh, like the mythological hero, or he explains it as an exploratory hero, someone who is playing the meta game. So you can think of each individual dominance hierarchy as a micro game. So when you're playing one of those individual games, you're not looking at the rest. And so that so the hero or the whatever the I, I like to say advantageous individual, but the person who is playing the meta game is basically competing on the hierarchy of hierarchies. So it's the person who competes in the game of excelling to the top or competing in it in as many dominance hierarchies as you can. And I think that that's a really 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 good empowering idea and uh, can keep you from becoming closed minded or small minded. And another really big part of Jordan Peterson that I liked a lot is he used, um, like I said, ancient mythology to explain a lot of his ideas. 
And I had never heard about the Mesopotamian creation story or the Egyptian creation story. Um, he talks a lot about the Bible. He has, he has another series on his YouTube. It's a psychological significance of the Bible where he goes through and breaks down a lot of, I think, I think every Bible story, basically. And that's a really interesting series, too. I've only watched a couple. In Maps of Meaning, there's a lot of talk about the Bible because he basically looks at Bible as, um, he explained it really well. It was, let me think of what he said. So the idea of how humans can accept suffering and experience the suffering willingly and then how they can live to the best of their abilities with the premise given that there has to be um, intentionally accepted suffering. It's a really interesting idea. I, I totally butchered it there, but either way. So with these older stories, they all kind of correlated in a really beautiful way that he explained in the lectures. So the person who is playing the metagame or is climbing to the top or competing in all these different hierarchies is competing for vision. Because at the top of the pyramid, you can think of like the eye at the top of the pyramid. What you achieve when you reach the top of the metagame pyramid or the metagame dominance hierarchy is you then have vision over the whole rest of the pyramid. So let's say we have one individual micro game pyramid here. Let's say it's physical strength. There are guys climbing this one. So once you get to the top of the physical strength dominance hierarchy, you have vision of everything going down below. Once you get to the top of the metagame hierarchy, you can see all the micro games and all the things going on below. And why that's important is because he really advocates for being able to articulate and being able to be aware and critical thinking. And so I, I can't even do that justice of how seriously he takes that. but. I'll kind of wrap it into this idea. So basically, I think I was really into uh, spirit, spirituality and, and philosophy before I started watching these lectures, but I never really had a concrete idea because I felt like I understood how all the themes correlated with one another and how all these religions and all these ideas were kind of pointing towards the same thing, you know, enlightenment, nirvana, and bliss and you know transcendence and whatever ego death all these different things they meant the same thing right and i could understand that but i couldn't necessarily totally formulate it into an applicable lifestyle what jordan peterson says basically is that the way to reach these things is one being aware of your, yourself and being aware of the world keep having vision having vision then being able to articulate to yourself and realistically being able to articulate with yourself what you believe is the highest ideals, the most virtuous, righteous ideals. And then you aim towards those. And then the way that you reach those and the way that you live in a state of heaven is through responsibility. He literally advocates that responsibility is the way to enlightenment. And I think that that's beautifully simple and beautifully eloquent because it's so true. Like uh, you've heard before, self-discipline is self-love. You know, you have to if you know something is good for you, you have to do it for it to mean anything. And he really advocates for that. And basically by aligning yourself with these high ideals, doing your best to then aim to then uh, strive towards them is what will bring you into a state of heaven. And I think that that's beautiful. There's also um, what we talked about in the very beginning with the value structures. So people use those value structures to orientate themselves and give their life meaning in the world. And uh, there was this idea of an anomaly. An anomaly is an unexpected event. So when you're orientated into the world and you're operating out of your value structure and you're seeing your reality because what you focus on, he talks about this a lot, what you're focusing on is creating your reality because you're looking at the world as tools that are going to further you along the path to your goal. So through that, you're creating the re your own reality because you're seeing only what is going to be helpful for you on your path to your goal. And um, that is heaven, by the way, because when, when you're pursuing something, that's where positive emotion comes from. The positive emotion does not come from obtaining it. It comes from the, from the journey or from the uh, progress you're making towards it. But either way, so the anomaly in the value structure, I thought that this was a beautiful way to explain why people are 
well, basically why there is venomous ideologies. That's something that I've, that, that, that phrase, venomous ideology, I don't know if you ever used that, but since I watched those lectures, I've been thinking about that idea a lot, venomous ideology. What that is, is when you have a value structure and, some, and someone presents you with, with an anomalous statement or an anomalous idea that challenges the foundation of your value structure and why people are literally willing to kill over that. Because when you bring them something that is going to rumble the foundation of the value structure, you're basically rumbling the foundation of their reality. And if you don't have resilience, and if you aren't willing to embrace chaos, then that rumble and can break your whole foundation and basically drive you into insanity. So that has really been able to explain to me why people argue, why people are <laughs> aggressive, and how unconscious that can be because once you feel that little tick, people like to call that the ego. I don't know necessarily how to correlate the value structure and the ego, but I mean, that's a discussion for another day. But you know, when someone says, when someone disagrees with you, you can kind of feel, you can see that subconscious kind of tick where you want to defend yourself. And uh, this is extrapolated out even more because this is not just your ego, but it's literally your reality you've created and what you are using to orientate yourself in the world. And if someone brings, you some kind of information or some idea that is basically um, presenting you with a potential fallacy in your own orientating structure that can be something that you have to defend or you're going to go crazy. And I think that that can be such an empowering idea because it can really give you grace. You can It bestows upon you serious grace and bestows upon other people serious grace. Almost like a childlike innocence. I don't mean to sound condescending, but in a way you can look at others through the lens of grace because you understand that what you say, if it happens to trigger them, you are, you are catalyzing a eruption of their foundation that's being able to orientate themselves. I think that's so amazing. And um, so there's a big idea too about metaphors and um, about the hero's journey and the metaphor for chaos or like water and all these different, so like water being chaos because you don't know what's underneath the water and that basically neurophysiologically uh, signals, you know, things that make us want to go into either fight or flight because we don't understand what's under there and it's scary to us and it's, it's unknown. We have known territory and unknown territory. It talks about that a lot. What's known territory is what you understand and, you know, it's like culture. He talks a lot about culture and nature, culture being dominant and fatherly. Um, well, not dominant, but culture being father, nature being mother, and um, culture being known territory, nature and the mother being unknown territory. And this is where you feel safe and this is where you are able to um, feel complacency, I guess you could say too. And then this with nature and mother and chaos and unknown, this is where the potential lies. And that's why the idea what you want most is where you least want to look because over here in your kingdom, you are safe but you know everything, you know, there's nothing to be learned. There's, sure, you can say that there's safety and there's life to be had and there's family and there's, you know, all those things and that's, I'm not debating that, of course. But then over here is where one grows and this is the realm of the exploratory hero because what the exploratory hero will do will go from the safety of the kingdom, he will travel into the land of the unknown and he will be able to basically illuminate the unknown for himself or for herself and then once he's done doing that, he can bring the illuminated ideas and the new information and the unknown. He can bring the unknown into the known and illuminate the darkness for the others dwelling in the known, which is a really, really profound, beautiful idea. And it's so metaphorically dense, of course, but um, super, super, super empowering because fear, which is a product of the unknown, Fear is then something to be embraced and appreciated because if you're feeling fear, then you have something to overcome and through that overcoming, you're, take, you're embarking upon a hero's journey. And um, there's so much about the phoenix and you know identity and dissolving and then coming out from the ashes and how when you go into the unknown, you're, you know, you're going through an internal battle too because what you're scared of is manifesting in front of you, but that's also a product of your own subconscious tendencies of who you think you are and all these things that are just so profound. Anyway, so those are a couple ideas with the maps of meaning thing that I, maps of meaning lectures that I think are really advantageous to 
just learn about and hear about. And I think I said before, you know, he's not a messiah. You know, he has parts of it that I would necessarily wouldn't agree with or whatever, but he's a man just like anyone else's. And listening to him brings you a perspective that only he can bring you. And he's thought about these ideas, he's talked about them, and he can articulate them in just in a beautiful way that can help you think about some things, especially if you take notes on them and try to then transmute them into your own language and understanding. And one of the biggest things too that he's helped me do outside of his lectures is start reading good authors. He is the person who advocated and got me into reading Dostoevsky, which has brought me, um, you know, unquantifiable amounts of value. Um, he also got me in Schultzenitsen, the Gulag Archipelago. Uh, he has a reading list on his website. I haven't really gone to his website, but he has tons of books on there. But he refers to plenty of books in the lectures. And when he's going through, speaking on something that you really want to learn more about, and then he happens to name drop a book, boom, go read that book. And then it's like, oh, wow, that was worth it. That was worth it. And uh, I learned so many words. It expanded my vocabulary to the next world. Um, uh, he also really helped me remember how important it was to just be able to take myself seriously and take responsibility, which is not something that I had forgotten. But as a kid, I felt like I, well, I, I'm only 20, but as a teenager, I went through phases where, you know, I wanted to be fun and buoyant and, you know, creative and whatever, transparent and just whatever. And then I went through phases where I wanted to be serious and you know, make sure everyone knew who I was and everything. And then I started to think that that was my ego, who the one that wanted to be serious. But after watching the lectures, I had a new idea of what serious meant. And it was like literally um, holding true to what I believe. If you don't hold true to what you believe, then what are you? And um, it's not like what you believe can never change. But if you never believe anything, then you never have any value structure to orientate yourself into reality. And people can't take you seriously if you don't take yourself seriously. Yeah. He refers a lot to Carl Jung. Uh, there's a lot of great references to Carl Jung he makes. He makes a lot of great references to all sorts of scientists that you've never heard of, too. And uh, I went and checked out so many of those guys. And immense amounts of value from Jordan Peterson. I'd highly recommend going and watching him. But I would also highly recommend going and watching him with take it seriously you know like don't just look at it like something you're gonna watch for pleasure i'm not saying you won't enjoy it but look at it as something that you're going into to learn from you know take a notebook take a pencil put your phone down turn it off go somewhere quiet and put in the time and like really put in the effort to learn and hear what he has to say and really put in the effort to think about it too because if you do that it'll change your life i mean i don't mean to sound profound but yeah it'll definitely change your life and um, yeah, he has two books, Maps of Meaning, 1999, and then um, he wrote it in 1999. The other one is, I think, 12 Rules for Life. I haven't read that one, but he put that one out in 2016. Like I said, I've watched over 25 hours of Jordan Peterson lectures and taken over probably 40 hours of notes between writing them and looking them over. So I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of his overall message. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in anything that I've said throughout this video, I would go check him out. Um, Jordan Peterson, if you ever see this, thank you. Really appreciate what you've done for me and uh, I'll continue to advocate for you and your cause and I hope your talks are going well. I don't know if Jordan Peterson is still a teacher in Canada. Uh, it seems like lately he's been going around the world doing lectures after his uh, newfound YouTube fame or internet fame, which I'm happy for him for. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you. For watching. Don't forget to give me a like and a subscribe. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Peace.